Hello, READ 585. This is the last and final part of lectures for week four. I've been doing a review of readings from the previous week and then giving just a brief preview of upcoming readings. So that's what I will be doing in this last and final lecture. So these are our objectives that you can be able to explain key understandings of the Common Core State Standards and that you can describe practices for effective language arts instruction that coming from chapter two of the current California framework and that you can also describe practices for effective schools which you will learn about in the readings for week four. All right, so getting started with the Common Core State Standards, I'm not going to do a lot with that this because you should have viewed the Brokers of Education webinar uh, last week, the professional development learning module, which I think they did a fabulous job and I kind of want to take some time and take a look at some of the other ones they did, but some things you should know. The standards are a collaborative effort between the Council of Chief State School Officers, CCSSO, and the National Governors Association, emphasis on the word national. A lot of times the Common Core State Standards are perceived as a federal effort and the federal government coming in and telling us what to do in schools, when in actuality it is um, there, the outcome of a national effort. So it has been a state-led collaboration effort where states have voluntarily adopted them with the exception to a few, Alaska, Texas, Nebraska, Minnesota, and Virginia. Individual states can actually add up to 15% of their own standards to the Common Core state standards. So last week you probably perused the document of the California Common Core state standards and you will notice that when you came to a standard in bold with the CA abbreviation next to it, that indicated one that has been added by the state of California. So each state can add up to 15%. The standards themselves were released June 2nd, 2010, and then California shortly adopted them in August of 2010, so just a few months later. And in three words, when you think about the Common Core, you want to think fewer because we are doing more depth and less breadth, Those, so there's actually a fewer number of standards. They are clearer and more focused on what's really important developmentally for that grade level. And then lastly, they are higher expectations, more rigorous expectations for students. So fewer, clearer, higher, that is the Common Core State Standards in three words. Guiding principles of the standards is college and career readiness. So they were designed for students to prepare for college or if not on that path to be career ready. So right now, as you've heard, even those students who pass high school still face remediation in college and we do not want that to be the reality. So they were developed to prepare students for college and beyond. Next, they used the best state standards in order to compile the Common Core state standards. And actually 48 states contributed their best work. They are based on research and evidence. They have a clear focus, like I was telling you, they are really focused on what matters most. Not a lot of standards, but more depth that we're doing. Rigorous expectations, if you haven't looked at them, just even looking at writing, instead of doing narratives in lower elementary, we are doing persuasive opinion and informational pieces. They need to write from sources. They need to do their own research. So there's a lot more rigor involved. There's also local flexibility. Like I mentioned, the ability to add standards for your state and then teacher judgment. So they don't dictate how to teach. They're not a mandated curriculum. There's room for teachers to use their own judgment. So the key shifts with the standards are text complexity and range. So we want to prepare students to read more complex text because as it discussed in the introduction you read, they need to be prepared to read increasingly more 
informational passages. So with the Common Core Standards, they have some pretty important appendices. Appendix B actually has the exemplar text of suggested text to read for each grade level. These are not a mandated book list by any means, but they are samples of what would be an appropriate text for that grade level according to the Common Core. And again, we want to remember to expose them to more informational passages. It should be 50% literary, 50% informational in grade four, but that means throughout the course of their entire day. So your literacy block doesn't have to be 50% liter literary, 50% informational. It can be throughout the whole span of your day, but definitely exposing them to more informational text. Another key shift is to have them do more analyzing, more inferring, and more citing of evidence. So remember those text-to-self connections? Well, we don't really care about them. Uh, last year at the IRA conference, I attended a session with Lucy Hawkins, who, wow, she is a biting speaker. Wow, I didn't realize she was so fired up about the Common Core. But she had us read this poem, and then she asked us to describe what the poem reminded us of. And a lot of people made personal connections to the poem. And afterwards, she said, you know, raise your hand if you made a personal connection to the poem. And she said, we don't care about your personal connection. The Common Core State Standards, they don't care about your personal connection. They want you to look at word choice. They want you to look at craft structure. They want you to use text evidence to support a claim. So that was definitely a very vivid example of we're not here to talk about fluff we're here to make claims you know cite evidence give our reasoning welcome common core also writing to sources we are using this year a pretty awesome writing curricular tool that I really love it is called Explorations in Nonfiction Writing, and Linda Hoyt is the main author on that. It's, I think it's K-5. Yeah, it's K-5 right now, but it is great. It is very aligned to Common Core, very teacher-friendly. It even comes with mentor texts that are informational. Lower grades get a big book of informational texts, and then upper grades just get a smaller set of passages to be used as mentor texts. But everything you need is, is right there. It's really well structured. It's broken into sections by the Common Core State Standards. I really, really love it. So that's explorations in nonfiction text if you need a writing tool. And it's, it's pretty uh, reasonable if you're looking for something to teach writing in a Common Core way. And then lastly, mastery of both speaking and writing. So using academic language, you might remember the difference between BIX and CALP, basic interpersonal communication, and then cognitive academic language. So we really want to push the academic vocab, the student discourse, both mastery of speaking and writing. Hmm, I don't know if anyone caught this, but on page two of the introduction, it says literacy standards for grade six and above are based on the expectation that teachers of ELA, history, social studies, science, and technical subjects use their expertise to help students meet the particular challenges of reading, writing, speaking, listening, and language in those content areas. So now there are actually literacy standards for grades 6 through 12, uh, and they are titled, you know, the standards for literacy in history, social studies, science, and technical subjects. So for all of those content area teachers giving you pushback about literacy practices in their content areas, you can conveniently remind them, well, hey, there are actually standards for literacy in your subject area now, and I am very happy to collaborate with you on embedding those in your content area instruction. So these standards are not meant to supplant the content area standards, they're meant to supplement them and really provide that mastery of language art skills that we are looking to do so that students are prepared for college should they choose and that we are reading more technically above a fourth grade level. More on the standards. They don't mandate a certain process for writing or a certain set of comprehension strategies. They really just tell us what students should know to be prepared. They're backwards mapped from college readiness and not how teachers should be teach, 
They do represent an integrated model of literacy, emphasizing reading, writing, listening, and speaking. They are broken out into different, you know, uh, strands, I believe is what they would be called. Yes, a strand is reading, a strand is writing, strand is speaking and listening, and then a strand is language. So even though they're divided into strands, they're meant to be taught uh, in a unified way, integrated. They emphasize focus and coherence, so we're focusing on a smaller number of things. And then coherence in that we don't need to separate the standards, but we can kind of unify them and teach a few of them together at the same time. And then it is beyond the scope of the standards to address English language learners and students with special needs, which is why uh, the framework California is working on, if you took a look at it, they are trying to merge the ELA standards with the English language development standards to create one document. Sounds pretty genius to me. All right, there are some more learning modules from the California Department of Education. So here they are, a lot for mathematics, some for English language arts. So they actually have one on a lot of the key shifts, like I said, writing to inform, are you analyze? informational text. They have some uh, learnings for the different subject areas as well as English language learners, how to align IEPs to the Common Core C standards. I know there's some um, special education and resource teachers out there. You might want to check those out. And then multi-tiered system of support. Sounds like RTI to me. Uh, they even have a learning for that. So I kind of want to check out some more of those. Also, Common Core resources, if you want to go directly to the Common Core website, that's just corestandards.org. I encourage you to look at Appendix B. It has those exemplar texts I was telling you about. And then Appendix C actually has student writing samples that shows you the expectations for student writing at that grade in informational, in persuasive opinion argument, I guess they're calling it argumentative, and then for just the normal narrative. Uh, I was looking at the third grade informational uh, sample, student work sample the other day, helping the second grade teachers plan their informational text writing unit. They're doing rainforest reports right now, and we, so we were looking at those, and uh, it was two and a half pages typed this third grade informational text. Actually, why don't I show you? Why don't I show you? Let's check it out. So if you go to corestandards.org and you go to the standards, you have English language arts standards. You scroll all the way down. Here, check it out. Grade 6 through 12 literacy. Here are the appendices. So appendix B I was telling you about has those exemplar texts. Well, again, let me just show you. Do, 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 do. Um, I'm going to pause. All right, so here's 183 pages of exemplar text. So it tells you grades four or five text exemplars, gives you some samples for stories, samples for poetry, samples for informational text. So that might be pretty helpful to you. In Appendix C, like I was telling you about, there are student writing samples, which are pretty eye-opening, but can also serve as a nice um, metric of sorts to compare your student work samples to. So the second grade teachers were talking about, you know, what should our second grade informational writing look like? And I said, oh, let's pull up, you know, the student work samples. And we found this one for third grade about horses. And we took a look at this is kind of the model oops, student work sample. We have two and a half pages there all about horses. So that's a good resource for you to be aware of. Let's go back to this. Um, also, smarterbalance.org. So as you'll remember, states could opt into one of the two uh, collaboratives. Uh, California and Michigan both are actually in Smarter Balance. And then the other states participating are in PARC, which um, has a similar looking website, but if you go here, Smarter Balanced Assessments, Practice and Pilot Tests, Sample Items and Performance Tasks, so you can take a look at what the tests there 
currently working on to be ready for the 14-15 school year look like? So those are some resources you may want to check out. All right, let's talk about chapter two of the existing framework titled Goal and Key Components of Effective Literacy Instruction. So they come up with four components of a balanced, comprehensive approach to reading. The first being that we need a strong literature, language, and comprehension program that includes a balance of oral and written language. Oral language so important. So often students are not doing the discourse and the participation and discussions that they need to be doing. So very important to develop language orally and in writing. Second, we need an organized, explicit skills program that includes phonemic awareness, sounds and words, phonics and decoding skills to address the needs of the emergent reader. So remember that systematic and explicit phonics instruction. We want to have a clear focus on a certain spelling pattern, which Imagine It Open Court did really well providing that systematic explicit phonics instruction, which is why students are now very good decoders, but not as good at comprehending. We also need ongoing diagnosis that informs teaching and assessment. Wow, sounds like the diagnostic prescriptive approach. And it will also hold us accountable to make growth with our students. Lastly, we need a powerful early intervention program, sounds like RTI, that provides individual tutoring for, tutoring for students at risk of failure in reading. So maybe your tier three uh, grouping would be individual one-on-one. -on -one. All right, also we have the key components of an effective language arts program. So they gave you a number of them, starting with assessment practices. So making sure that we have our formative assessments and we are actually using them to inform instruction and provide strategic instruction based off of the assessments, which we worked on in 516. And we really want uh, the assessment data to inform our decisions we're using for those support systems. Instruction, we need it to be high quality. We need it to be differentiated for all students. Instructional time, this was a big one, not sure if you caught it, but two and one half hours of instructional time is allocated to language arts instruction daily. So we want to have adequate time allocated and then students with special learning needs, we want to make sure we provide them the additional time that they need. And then it also talked about providing reading time even outside of school and encouraging opportunities for instruction outside of the school day. Instructional programs and materials are also part of an effective language arts program. Just make sure your instructional program isn't dictating what your curriculum is. Your curriculum should be based on the California Common Core State Standards and then the program you're using should support that instruction. Instructional grouping and scheduling. So always those instructional grouping should be flexible. They should be used to maximize student performance. You want to have a combination of whole group instruction, but then also small group instruction. All right, differentiated instruction will provide opportunities for more intensive remediation. But you also need to think about extending the proficiency of students who are advanced learners, differentiating with lang English language learners in mind, classroom instructional and management practices. This is key. We really need to maximize our instructional time and effectiveness. Not sure if you're familiar with the work of Doug Lamov, but basically he made a big name for himself by videotaping effective teachers and labeling things they do. One term he came up with was 100% and it's the idea that 100% of students are on task 100% of the time and that's something I like to coach teachers in because if they are not on task and they're not with you, they're not going to be getting the information or the content you are trying to deliver. So we need to have a highly interactive classroom 
where students are given high quality instruction, they're given feedback, there are high levels of engagement, there's lots of appropriate activities and resources, there are clear expectations behaviorally and academically, we have smooth transitions and routines, we're not going around desk to desk, kid to kid, passing out each individual paper. Is, the way, is there a way we could pass them out to tables or have them on their desks already or have a paper pass or do it at recess so when they come in the paper's are already there? How are we maximizing our routines and transitions? Professional development, also very important. It needs to be focused on student learning. If educators can participate in the planning of their own professional development, they'll be more invested in that. It should also be ongoing and in-depth. Administrative practices, so the administrator should be very knowledgeable about English language arts. It sounds like with a master's in reading, you might be a great administrator. They also need to be ensuring instructional time is protected and supporting the development of explicit school-wide grade level and individual performance goals, basically showing a commitment to academic excellence. Parent and community involvement is important, making sure parents are well informed. We did a parent information session about the Common Core because that was a big shift in education, so I wanted them to be well informed about that. Other things to consider, motivation. Motivation is huge. It says that in language arts instruction, motivation not only enhances the learning process, but also is a necessary precursor for students choosing to read on their own. And we know that if students are motivated to read on their own, they're going to be gaining more from that incidental word learning, working on monitoring, developing comprehension, right? Matthew effects, Stanovich, the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. So we want to motivate them to read them at all times. Anything else to say about that? Um, no, just that motivation and reading for pleasure are mutually reinforcing. Keep that in mind. Next is effort. Those high achievers, right? The successful people are the ones who are consistently exerting an enormous amount of effort. So how can we push students to put in their best effort? Are we accepting their best work? Are we accepting sloppy work? No, they should be redoing it. Bring it back. They need to make it better at their own time, like at recess. So successful classrooms are places of expectation and responsibility. And last but not least, proficiency in academic language is very important because we know vocabulary oftentimes precedes uh, reading. So it's hard to read a word and decode it and understand it if you don't already have it in your vocabulary. All right, what else about chapter two? Well, did you know, according to the framework, two and one half hours, yeah, we talked about that already. In grades four through eight, two hours or two periods of instructional time should be dedicated to language arts instruction. And then in grades nine through 12, all students should at least have one course per semester of language arts instruction. So important, the foundation for all content areas. All right, I enjoyed this visual here, which breaks down the curriculum. So we have decoding on one side, comprehension on the other. Both are very important. In decoding, we have word recognition and we have fluency. What helps us with word recognition is concepts about print, phonemic awareness, phonics, sight words. What have, helps us with fluency, sight words, automaticity. Over here, we have academic language. So we need background knowledge, vocabulary, syntax. And then with comprehension, it's important to know text structure helps you make predictions about what you're going to read about, summarize the main idea if you know the text structure, comprehension monitoring, and then reorganizing of the text. So that was a little bit about effective language arts instruction and the Common Core State Standards, which are going to be the more rigorous standards we will need in order to provide the best education for our students to be college and career ready.
So I'm going to wait to talk about the week four readings next week. Again, everybody's reading the AYP informational guide. And then you get to pick one of the following. Building Knowledge and Fashioning Success One School at a Time is from our good friend Marjorie Lipson, University of Michigan. She and her colleagues looked at the uh, categorized schools into different regions and then within those regions looked at outlier schools both students performing very positively and uh, not students but schools schools who are doing a great job and then schools who are not so successful and then looked at what made the schools successful or not very interesting discussion there. And then the second article is also very good. It is from Douglas Fisher, Nancy Frey, Diane Lapp from San Diego State University. They took a school, Western High School they're calling it, which sounds like it's in a kind of remote area somewhere, maybe I think it was like two hours, they kept mentioning the two hour drive from San Diego. Um, they came up with some steps for school improvement and then they applied them to Western High School. They had all teachers implement some concrete reading strategies. You need to read and find out what those are. But then lo and behold, after six months, they doubled their performance of, of proficient readers on the state test. They went from 12% initially, well, they almost doubled, 21% proficient then in the spring and then two years later 47 percent so more than tripling it uh, the the following year so you may want to read and find out what they did because it was highly successful so enjoy those readings they're both really good I really enjoyed the secondary level one but elementary good too we know how we love our Lipson and Wixson. So hopefully at this time you have more information on the Common Core State Standards. You also have some ideas for effective practices in language arts, and we'll be getting more for effective schools. All right, to launch you today, I have a quote from Walt Disney that we actually say every day as a school as we are leaving our morning opening ceremony and the person leading opening ceremony says if you can dream it and then all the students yell you can do it so that is my thought for you if you can dream it you can do it you have completed four weeks of this online class we don't have too many well 13 to go but we will get there hope you are learning lots and definitely email me if you have any questions